Good morning, saints of God. I have the announcement. All September birthdays, happy birthday from the Great Olivia Baptist Church family. Every Sunday, 940, we do have Sunday school. And I would like to encourage everybody, from the youngest to the oldest, to come out on Sunday school. I guarantee you, you'll get something out of that. And then we have at 11 a.m. Sunday morning worship. Every Wednesday, 6.15, prayer meeting. At 7 p.m., Bible study. Masks are required to be worn inside the sanctuary. So please make sure you're wearing them and keeping them on. Thank you so much. They get hot, they're uncomfortable, but please keep your mask on. Today, the Welcome Committee will be having a meeting after morning service in the annex. And anybody that is wishing to join the Welcome Committee, please come and join us. It's, it's, it's awesome. So after service in the annex, the Welcome Committee will be having a meeting. Monday, September the 12th, 2022, at 12 p.m. noon, the Golden Age Ministry Meeting, and at 6.15, Men's Ministry Meeting. Sunday, September the 18th, 2022, after morning service, Usher Board and Junior Usher Board Meeting. Tuesday, September the 20th, 2022, at 6 p.m., Justice Ministry and Bill Network Meeting. Sunday, the 25th of September, 2022, no morning service. No Sunday school, I'm sorry, no Sunday school. We will have 8 a.m. morning worship at Real David Baptist Church. 8 a.m. Y'all get on up and be here at 8 o'clock. Then we'll get on down the road. Um, Pastor Marcus Underwood and Greater Liberty Baptist Church Choir and Congregation will be in fellowship with Greater Israel Baptist Missionary Baptist Church at 1509. <coughs> Excuse me, Magazine Street, Louisville, Kentucky, celebrating Bishop Brian Litton Sr.'s fifth pastoral anniversary. Dinner will be served. And let's not forget our 2022 Pledge for Growth. All members are asked to give $10 above their tithes and offering every month for the entire year. Thank you. These are our announcements. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, y'all awake today. <laughs> yeah. On behalf of our pastors, the pulpit, and the congregation, I would like to welcome all visitors. I pray this morning that something will be said to help you along your walk with God. Again, I say welcome. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everybody. I got a question. Has God been good to anybody in here? I got a question. Has God been good to anybody in here? Come on, you ought to stand on your feet and let's just praise the Lord in here today, man.
just praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. Now we'll be reading from Isaiah 25, verse 1. Oh, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Again, I've read Isaiah 25, 1. The Lord's word has already been blessed. Let him have a blessing to the hear it. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, first of all, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can stand here all day and say thank you. For the things that you have done, the things that you are doing, and the things that you will do. And I say thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, I say thank you for allowing me to rise this morning to see another one of, one of your days, oh, Heavenly Father. A day that is with, known as a present and gift from you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, now I just want to thank you for that gift. You allow my mouth, my tongue not to be glued to the roof of my mouth. My eyelids was not glued closed. You allow me to be able to see the wonders of your work, so Heavenly Father. I can see the sky. I can see the clouds. I can hear the birds. I can hear the nature calling, oh Heavenly Father. Your wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing me to be able to come into your house one more time. Thank you for my wife by my side. Thank you for my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. Oh Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless the one that's going to come and stand before us, oh, Heavenly Father, and preach one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Oh, Heavenly Father, let him move himself out of the way and dig deep into your bosom, oh, Heavenly Father. Pull out a word and share with us, oh, Heavenly Father. And let us not just be listeners of your word, but let us go out and be doers of your word, oh, Heavenly Father. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, just thank those that are understand my voice. I ask you to bless me, oh, Heavenly Father. Even those that are listening virtually, oh, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Forgive me, oh, Heavenly Father, my sins. If I know I'm paying short, oh, Heavenly Father, forgive me of past sins, forgive me of present sins, and forgive me of future sins. Thank you. I can just stand here all day and say thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, I ask you in all blessings in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that you know that he's good because yeah. good is just who God is. Yeah. But is there anybody here who knows God to be better? better than oh, oh, what? Oh, oh, come on. 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 Come
with a portion of health and strength and the activities of our limbs. Thank you, God, just for being God and God all by yourself, God. God, we love you. We adore you, God. Just for who you are, God. Pray, God, for our pastor, God. Pray, God, that you would just give him something over and something to do to preach. That someone would go right in what you must not do to be saved, God. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Friends, everybody, please stand for the hymn.
I don't wish to say that. Our mission is to reach the world abroad, teaching them the infallible gospel of God's grace, through His Father, Son, Jesus Christ, and the truth unto salvation.
given among men, yeah. by which man shall be saved, but by the name of Jesus. Yes, sir. Lord, there is nothing <laughs> like you. Just another opportunity to gather ourselves together in corporate worship. I don't take it for granted. If anything, COVID should have taught you that. I don't take for granted. God seeing fit on allowing us to come together one more time. Praise God. Would you all pray with me this morning? In this text, brothers, I need you all to put your foot to me a little bit. Not really sure where the Lord gonna take this message today. <laughs> but the only thing I know is that God is true to himself. Yeah. And he don't need my help. If I spend time and I stand, he will preach. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. To the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. To the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. I'm going to look at verses 4 and verse 20. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 4 and 20. If you haven't, please say amen. If you need no more time, say give me one sec. Still have to hear a few pages. Ezekiel 18, verses 4 and 20. We got Follow along with me. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Amen. 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 Tell 
child of God, I, I, I must uh, I must preface going into this message by just throwing out this disclaimer that in no way by today's message do I I realize today is 9-11. I realize today is 9-11, and I in no way attempt to even uh, dismiss what happened on that tragic day, or to diminish the tragedy of that day. In no way, I didn't even realize that it was 9-11 until I open my manuscript to jot some notes down and I always date my messages. And I was like, shucks, it's 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, Lord, is this gonna come off right? <laughs> oh, 9-11. But anyway, here it goes. <laughs> tell somebody today we serve a just God. We serve a just God. And before you get before you answer too quickly in the affirmative in agreement with that know what that means. It sounds nice to say God is a just God but what we're saying when we say God is a just God we're saying that God is a God of justice. Yeah. That's what we're saying. He's a God of justice. If he does not get justice, then he's not God. Amen. I need us to hear, I need you all to hear me a little bit this morning. If he does not get justice, he's not God. Because then he would be a liar. God is a God of justice. And, and what I want us to understand from the text today, we have the prophet Ezekiel, and Ezekiel was sent by God just like Jeremiah was. And Ezekiel was one of those prophets who God raised up that actually went into exile with the with to, to the Babylonia with the Jews. He went in the second group. But he was raised up to basically sound the alarm and be a watchman, and he was told to go tell the people what I said. The thing is about him, the reason why God in chapter 18 told Ezekiel to go tell these folk that all the souls are mine. The father and the son. Was because if you back up just a little bit in verse 2 and 3 of chapter 18 he said in verse 2 that you all are using this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. He told them you can no longer use this excuse. Because what they were trying to claim was that they were being unjustly punished for what their fathers did against God. And what God told Ezekiel to tell them is that every man, every woman is accountable to their own iniquity. He was letting them know because, you know, it, it's, it's part of our corrupt nature to place blame somewhere else. It's never just me. 
I'm never that bad. I, I, what I did wasn't so wrong. You got to understand, they got to blame as well. I, I didn't ask to be put in this situation. I didn't ask to be born in poverty. I didn't ask to be born and raised in a foster home. I didn't ask for none of this. So how can it be my fault that I am the way it is? It's part of our corrupt nature to place blame yeah. off of ourselves. Yeah. And Israel was being tormented. Israel, y'all know we went through the book of Lamentations in Bible study. You know what God put his own people through, his own church through, how he came through the town, came through the city, even the holy city of Jerusalem, and burnt it down to ashes. They went through so much suffering and pain, even the women were eating their own children. And this was in the house of God. You need to understand, they came complaining, why are you punishing us for what our forefathers did? And God said, Y'all won't be able to use that excuse. He said it right there in verse 3. You got your Bible on me? He said, as I live, saith the Lord, ye shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. In other words, he was saying, don't bring it up again. Don't never think that God is ever unjustif unjustified in what he allows. He's a just God. That means that everything he does, everything he allows, everything he permits is according to his own justice. Child of God, every mouth may be stopped so that all the world shall become guilty before God. Paul told us this in Romans chapter 3 and 19, 21 of them. Because what he went on to tell us is that where there is no sin, where there is no law, there is no sin. So then it kind of tells us what the purpose of the law was. The purpose of the law was to expose you to yourself. Right. So not only would you know how ugly you are, but that the world may know how corrupt you are. So while you sit up, with your silver spoon, your fine clothes, your big degree, your high position, sitting up in churches with your legs crossed and your duty and work perch. And how you point fingers at the one that doesn't dress as nice look as nice, smell as nice, talk as nice, may not be as educated or as smart as you are, and somehow may have just gotten out of prison or been accused and they got issues and their name has been read in the street. God says all oh, have become guilty. And there is none righteous no, not one. And don't ever sit up and think, I don't care how warm and cozy or how good you think you have lived your life. If cancer rids your body, if I take your children, if I cut everything you have out of your life, I'm just a 
Jesus back. He said, I'm justified. I'm justified because you're just as dirty and deserving as the homeowner, the adulterer, the murderer, the rapist, the homosexual, the black buyer. He just is messed up. Some of these jokers in the past, they messed up. Some of your forefathers and your mothers have messed up. And you know what? God. God will call some folk to suffer from the iniquities through their offspring. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. God will punish your children to make you suffer. He will do that. Don't get me wrong. Because see what I don't want to see some of y'all. See, I, got, I know I got some Bible readers in here. I got one or two Bible readers in here. So, so see, I know that some of y'all, y'all read the Bible, and you read where in Exodus, I guess it's around, what is it, Exodus 20 and 5, where he said actually in the Word of God, let me turn to it, so I get it right. Exodus 20 and 5, where he actually said, he said that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children until the third and fourth generation of them that hate him. Now see, I understand what you say, because some of y'all are saying, well, does that not contradict? You said already that the, that the iniquity of the, of the father is not on the son. And the son of, and the iniquity of the son is not on the father. How then do those two reconcile? See, I need you to understand, for one, there is outward punishment and there is inward punishment. I need you to also understand that the thing is, in God punishing you, he can also do that through your offspring. But, beloved, the inward punishment does not necessarily bear on the iniquities of the father. In other words, your father could be jacked up. Your father could have been left to himself. And at the same time, he could have used the child to punish the father by the child going through some hardships that were beyond his own control. But at the same time, he does not leave that child to the reprobate self. He still has every intention to save that child in spite of their conditions, in spite of their illness, and not leave them in the iniquities of the father. Is good Are you with me so far? So they reconcile. It's not one contradicting the other. In other words, you can't go to hell for your parents' transgression. But it don't mean that you can't be afflicted because of your parents' transgression. Because afflicting you brings affliction on them. He says, all souls belong to me. All of them belong to me. Child of God, all creation is God's workmanship. And one would rather defend the work of his hands than destroy it. We got to be careful. We got to be careful about placing this gross accusation on God to entertain the notion that God somehow tyrannizes over men and gains some level of pleasure by cutting them off or by punishing sin. I need you to know that he is the father of all creation. And I don't know about you, but anything that you've ever created with your own hands, it has some value to it, don't it? 
you, you place value on that thing. You, even if it don't look that good. Even if it didn't turn out the way you really wanted and intended for it to turn out. You still hold some value on that thing. Why? Because you made it. And if you have to destroy it, if you have to tear it apart, if you have to tear it down, a part of you is going to be remorseful. God gets no pleasure out of administering punishment and judgment on his creation. He told us that in verse 23. He told us that in verse 23. He said, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? And not that he should return from his ways and live. He's telling us he don't get no pleasure out of that. But don't get it twisted. And take my kindness and long suffering for weakness. I am a just and righteous and holy God. And everyone must give an account for himself. The soul that sinned, he says it shall die. I want us to understand that this is not God saying that everyone who sins is going to eternally be separated from him. That's not what God is saying. Because if that was what he was saying, it would completely shut the door on mercy. Yes. Yes. It would completely shut the door on mercy. So that's not what he's saying in the text. But what he is saying in the text is that every soul that sinned deserves to die and be separated from this holy and righteous God. I need us to quit thinking that God is like you and I. We got to stop that. I know we judge. But the Bible says judge not lest ye be judged. And the Bible also says why do you judge folk in areas where you yourself fail? But we judge. We, we, we put people on different. Yeah. We can't look at everybody and they all, everyone's on the same playing field. We can't, we can't do that. We, we don't have the capacity to do that. And it's because we're such emotional, fickle creatures. I can't love you if you hate me. It's hard for me. It's hard for us to do. I, I, you, you, you smoke my cheek. I can't offer you the other side. <laughs> A thief doesn't deserve the same punishment as a rapist. A liar doesn't deserve the same punishment as a murderer. So we say, according to the laws of this land, the evangelical Southern Baptist movement has somehow painted that if a woman has an abortion, she's on her way to hell. Has somehow painted that if you live a homosexual lifestyle, you're on your way to hell. But at the same time, I ask the question. But you're a liar. But you're a bigot. But you're a fornicator and an idolater. 
But I guess just because you ain't doing what you calculate and rank as. Or if you just come and say, Lord, forgive me, I'm so sorry. That's what we have done. But the thing is, the Lord is simply saying, all have sinned. I, I know. Sin is a monster. And the thing is, well, I, I, I just want all of us to get in our... I want the Christian church just to get this in their minds. This self-righteousness. Oh, some of these denominations and what they teach and the foolish and ignorance of the people who believe it and stay under it blows my mind. But then I can only reconcile in my head the only reason they stay is because it makes them also feel self-righteous. It makes them feel like they're better than somebody. Yes. I may not be better than everybody, yes. but I'm better than you. Yes. <laughs> yes. It helps them sleep a little bit at night. Because they can think they better than somebody. Yes. Because they're adhering to some rules and some sets and some edicts of religion and Christianity. And I come to tell you, beloved, we're all deserving of the wrath of God. All of us. Every single one. I don't know how good you think they are. The Pope, he deserved to go to hell. Mother Teresa, he deserved to go to hell. Peter, Paul, James, John. They all deserve to go to hell. We don't want to, we say stuff, but we don't want to believe what God said. He said there are none righteous. That means there's nothing you can do to gain enough righteousness to what God is just going to say, all right, all that other stuff you did. But I'm glad. He didn't shut the door. Because he goes on, I'm almost through. Yes, but he says, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. What God did right here is God bounded himself. He bounded himself to a way to reconcile us back to him. Amen. The thing is, by God binding himself to righteousness, he's saying, if there is a way for you to be righteous, ye shall live. If there is a way for you to be white as snow, then ye shall live. And I see someone asking the question, what must I do to be saved? And the crazy thing is, if you ask 10 so-called Christians, you probably get 10 different answers. <laughs> I know if you ask 10 different denominations, you're going to get 10 different answers. If you ask other beliefs and religions, they'll give you an answer telling you, do this, do that. Don't do this, and don't you do that. Don't you go here, don't you dress that way. Don't you eat that. And 
if you can do all of this for the rest of your life, woo, you'll go to heaven. I don't know about y'all, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Who in their right mind? And, and they don't even realize how foolish they look by trying. They don't even realize how foolish they look by trying. There's one answer. He said, only righteousness. We serve a holy God. And anything that is not holy must be separated from him. And if there's none righteous and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and there's none good but God, how is it that you and I shall be reconciled? That's the question. That should be the question on the mind and heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever walked this earth. If God is who he says he is. Because he's like, but, but I'm, what I'm so glad is that in us trying to live up to our own self-righteousness, God reveals in himself how unrighteous we really are. And in seeing your unrighteousness will force you to do what? Humble thyself. To serve this God, it comes with humility. You can't be boastful. He knocked down all boasting. You can't boast about what you've done and who you are. He's knocked down all boasting. You cannot boast before man. God has revealed how unrighteous you really are. And the more he reveals to you of you, it ought to make you run to him. Remember I told you the law was not given with the intent that man could actually live up to it. Never. The Ten Commandments, none of it was given with the intention that man could actually live up to it. The law was given so man would know how far away from God he really is. And then it would thus cause him to look to God for saving grace. Because it ought to convince you, if the law ought to convince you that you cannot save yourself. And if there's any part of you that has convinced yourself that if you live a certain way, that God will be indebted to you, the devil is a liar. He owes you nothing. He owes us nothing. And even though he owes us nothing, he willingly, willingly, in the fullness of time, was born of a woman yeah. under the law yeah. to redeem us yeah. back to himself. Yeah. And he who knew no sin yeah. became sin yeah. just for me. Yeah. You need to know what that means. Yeah. Yeah. It means he became in that moment, in that hour, in his agony in the garden of Gethsemane, he became all that Marcus Underwood was. All of my ugliness and all of my backbiting, every ill thought that ever came through my mind, it was pressed on my Jesus. And he became sin for me. At that moment, why Jesus 
said on the cross, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? It's because in their time from the garden all the way up Golgotha's hill, he was too dirty to look at. Because all of our sins was pressed on. He had to separate himself from the lamb that was led to the slaughter. Hallelujah. I said that he was a just God. That's how I started off today's message. He's a just God. In this life, whatever happens to us, whatever we got to deal with, you have no room to complain. Even though we have circumstances and situations that bring about our why moments. Saying, why me, Lord? The quick answer is I deserve it. I know that's hard to swallow sometimes. That's difficult to accept. But we all stand as filthy rags in the nostrils of a holy God. So whatever I got to deal with down here, God is justified. But I'm glad that even though I must suffer some outward punishment, because he who knew no sin became my sin and went on that mountain and didn't say a mumbling word, but he let him mock it. He let him scourge it. Put a crown of thorns on his head. Make fun of it. Whip it. And point fingers at it. He did it all just for me. So that this just God could get justice and satisfaction on the Lamb of God. Because he became sin for me. When he hung on that cross, Marcus was up there. When he hung on that cross, Demetrius was up there. When he hung on that cross, Colin was up there. When he hung on that cross, I asked the question, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when the hammer was ringing on his hands? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when he gave up the ghost? Were you there when the Bible says, into my, into thy hands, I commend my spirit? Were you there when the earth went black? Were you there when the mountains begin to walk and roll? Were you there when the graves bust wide open? Were you there when the bell was ringing? From top to bottom, were you there when they crucified my Lord and they placed him in a borrowed tomb? Were you there when he got up early that Sunday morning with all power in his hand? Were you there when he left the great books with all of my mess? All of my sin, all of my wickedness, left buried in the grave, lost in the sea of forgetfulness. Were you there? Were you there? When he who knew no sin became sin just for me. But as 
that only righteousness shall live. So when he became my sin, when he took my punishment, when he died of sin's death, and became blackness, all in him at the same time.
some disappointments and some hurts. But when it's all over, I'm going to make it to the other side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. service 